You're in a good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. You know, we're talking about relationships tonight. We're talking about those relationships that we don't necessarily understand. You know, those relationships that we have, and some of y'all might be in them right now, where up is down and down is up, and you never know what's going to happen. You know, in the beginning of the relationship, it was fun, it was exciting, it was arousing, and all of a sudden things started changing. Hypocrisy started entering play. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. and Mrs. Hyde started beginning, and you started seeing these different personalities coming out. You started to know that there was something wrong, but you didn't know exactly what it was. You know, some people call it the elephant in the room. You know, other people just wonder, what is going on? Am I losing my mind? Is there something wrong with me? I've been good up to now, but something's seriously wrong. And so tonight we're talking about those relationships that you seem to not be able to pinpoint the problem, but you know there's a definite problem. We're talking about borderline personality disorder tonight. And borderline personality disorder is a condition that is onset when people are children. And it's all defined by the relationship that the child had with mom and dad and exactly what took place. And I know that people sit there and say, wah, wah, why do we always have to put things on our mom and dad? Why can't people get past that? But there are certain things that we learn as children that are very difficult to get past, especially when we don't know that it exists or especially when we don't have a definition for it or we can't really pinpoint it. So tonight, as we talk about borderline personality disorder, this might awaken you because it's surefire awakened me. I started realizing a lot of things about a lot of things pretty quick. And I've read a lot of books on borderline personality disorder. I've read a lot of books on it. But I'll be honest with you, they were hard to decipher. They were hard to decipher because a lot of things kind of sound like each other. So if any of y'all know about mental health, you know that there's things called borderline personality disorder. There's things called depression, manic depression, bipolar. I know everybody's heard of the bipolar one, right? Oh, she's just bipolar. And so we have all these things and people like to group stuff into other things. And then there's this whole thing called medication that people take. And then you just really never know what's going on. However, once you understand what I'm talking about tonight, this is going to impact your life for the rest of your life. You're going to learn some stuff tonight and we're going to have some fun, but you're going to learn some stuff. It's going to actually open your eyes to probably something that's been going on in your life for a long period of time. Now, this could actually open your eyes to dealing with your parents, meaning one of your parents is borderline personality disorder, okay? What if it's your wife or your husband, your spouse, your girlfriend or boyfriend? Even more than that, any relationship, what I'm going to be talking about today applies to anybody's relationship, okay? And that's key because... Borderline personality disorder doesn't just start and stop in a love affair or in a marriage. And you can find that, and it's so great because you're going to be able to define it, see it, understand it, get it, and decide if you want to deal with it or if you just had enough. This is all going to happen tonight. I know this is a big night, but this is something that needs to be talked about because it wasn't until the other day that I figured out something that was monumental in my life. I was able to figure out a situation in my life. I was able to figure out a family member that has and demonstrates qualities of borderline personality disorder. And I was able to understand that. And I was able to also understand the relationships. And also I was under, uh, able to understand why I would ever put myself around other borderline personality disorder suffering people. Because it was normalcy. Okay, and so think about that. It was normalcy. So a lot of times we have a family member and it doesn't have to be your mom or dad. This could be somebody that you're close to, like an aunt, an uncle, even a cousin that you spend time with that you got to know. And that person has borderline personality disorder or was deceased and had it. And you're used to being around that. And we're going to talk about the symptoms. We're going to talk about what people do when they do have borderline personality disorder, as well as the major traits 
that we see from someone that has borderline personality disorder and how you can start figuring out who's who and what's what. Because in this scenario, when you're dealing with someone with borderline personality disorder, it can make you feel very out of control. It can make you feel very confused. I just had a friend of mine that was in a relationship with a woman that had borderline personality disorder, and they dated for about seven to nine months. And she broke up with him quickly over something uh, irrational. It was like something about um, he didn't visit her when she had a cold one time. And so she decided that was it with the relationship. And it wasn't until I sat back and started thinking about it because he took it really, really hard. Like he took it um, very painfully. It wasn't something that was easy for him to deal with. And he's one of those people that can clearly bounce back from things. You know, he's a good old boy, good person. And I kind of started like looking into that particular relationship. And as I peered into different aspects and I started realizing different traits and different indicators, I realized that his ex suffers from borderline personality disorder. And because of that, when you are with a borderline, when you're in a relationship with a borderline, you already feel out of control. And, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of splitting of behavior. And splitting of behavior, that's more of a that's more of a therapist term, splitting of behavior. But what it means is you're going from one extreme to another. So you got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. and Mrs. Hyde. Okay, that's a good example. And you don't ever know what you're going to get. And you also don't even know what makes one of those personalities comes out. So, for example, you could come home tonight. Let's say tonight you're driving home, you're listening to the show you get home and you walk in the door and you ask your wife, how are you doing? How are you doing could be the catalyst to a, a very nice and, and, and good conversation or how are you doing could be the catalyst to I hate you. I'm going to throw things. I'm slamming the door. You are awful. Get out of my life. And there's a lot of things that can happen. And because your world is kind of turned upside down, you feel as though you've been placed in one of those ninja blenders, right? You feel like you've been placed in that blender, and it's like you've been shot out of a cannon. And the next thing you know, you're trying to get out of that blender. And as you get out of the blender, you obviously can't stand straight up because you're completely, you know, out of sorts. And when you finally start getting your footing and your sea legs, you might say, you get put back in the blender. Because that's what a life is like when you're living... With a borderline. So we're going to talk about, we're going to begin talking about borderline personality disorder and the fact of how certain traits exist because there are certain specific traits that define this condition separately than all other conditions. And I think that you're going to feel as though you've learned a lot tonight because this is, uh, this is big time. Once you get this type of knowledge, understanding and knowing people is a piece of cake. Because it's one thing to deal with depression. It's another thing to deal with mania. It's another thing to deal with bipolar. But it's another thing to deal with borderline. And the big difference between that and borderline and all those others is that borderline almost cannot love. A borderline would rather love someone that they cannot have who's married, who lives in another country, or their ex-wife or ex-husband, than to be able to love anybody that they can love. Because getting close to people is like the, it's like their kryptonite, okay? And they want to almost pervert things that are on a loving nature because of the relationship that they had with mom or dad. So let's begin talking about these specific traits. And I, and I think this is interesting because some of the traits – will combine with other type of clinical definitions. However, once you see the full picture that I'm painting for you, picture this. Italy, 1932. I, I like to do that. I used to love the Golden Girls. I still like the Golden Girls, but I remember that. Picture this. Milan, 1942. No, but as I paint this picture for you, and you begin to see what exactly I'm talking about, uh, this is going to open some doors. <laughs> This is going to open your brain. You're going to start thinking. You're going to be like, oh, my Lord. Oh, my stars. Oh, my goodness. I wish I would have known this before. But heck, it's better late than never. You know, you've all heard that song, Borderline, by Madonna. Over the borderline. Remember that? 
Keep on pushing my love over the borderline. Yeah, that's all about borderline personality disorder, by the way. I know, it's some major stuff here, okay? So we're going to talk about that. Let's talk about the first traits of a BPD, of a borderline personality disorder. First off, impulsivity. So they're very impulsive, okay? And I know a lot of people say, well, I got ADD and I'm very impulsive. I'll go out and buy, you know, a, a, a pair of... $2,000 $2,000 boots, and then I'll feel bad about it because I got, you know, retail therapy stuff going on and all that. But I'm talking about impulsive on every single level. Sexually impulsive, like outgoingly impulsive, impulsive on every level. And impulsivity is a very interesting thing because it can go from one extreme to the other. What about passive aggression? And I know that a lot of us say, hey, sometimes when I get angry, I might get a little passive aggressive. But this is a constant with a borderline. They don't argue and they don't fight fair. Straight up. They do not fight fair. They never have and they never will. I don't know if you remember, but it's kind of a dramatization, obviously. But a long time ago on one of the Seinfeld episodes, Elaine was dating a guy that had gone through a series of big time breakups. And on the first date, she's at the restaurant waiting for him to show up. And the waiter walks up to the table and says, are you Elaine Bennis? And she said, yes, yes, I am. And she goes, well, I have a note from so-and-so. He's not going to make it. He got stabbed. Well, anyway, her interest in this guy now that he got stabbed by an ex-girlfriend gets very interesting, and she's very enthralled with him. And she ends up going out on a date with him. And sooner than later, he starts making comments about how she has such a big head and all these other things. And she starts believing that she has a big head to the point where a pigeon, like, literally flies into her head and the guy was like it's like he couldn't even miss it or something it was so huge and i know that's a dramatization but the way that borderlines fight and the way that they argue is dirty fighting and when we return we're talking about that we're also going to be talking about more of the traits of a borderline and how you can define it and how you can understand where you are so stay tuned because perspectives with your host me ashley burgess will be back in we back this time in two shakes Jump in the deep end on Perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we're talking about borderline personality disorder, what you need to know, and how to deal with a situation where you find yourself with a borderline. And what I'm talking about actually is dealt with by a lot of people. I just found out the other day that one out of four men are borderline disorder. And I think it's one out of three women. And so this is a big time thing. This is big. And once you are able to define and understand what borderline means, you can begin to understand the situation that's arise, what is actually taking place. Because when you don't understand something, when I was a child, you know, I grew up having a condition that nobody understood. Nobody could figure out and nobody could define. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I actually got a definition and I actually got a word for what it is. And yeah, I understand that 180 people had in the world and it takes a long time to figure that out. But until I got an actual, hey, this is what it is, here's the definition, It made me feel better because I was able to understand it. I was able to grasp it because when we can define something, we're able to deal with it. When we can't define something, we can't put our finger on it. It's harder to to deal with. Think about it. When was the last time that you tried to deal with something that you couldn't see and you didn't know where it was coming from? I mean, think about this in a fight scenario. There you are at a place And all the lights go out, and all you feel is someone punch you in the face, but you can't see where it came from, and you have no idea how to survive. You have no idea how to countermeasure that, because you never know when the punch is going to come again, because you're in the complete dark, you can't hear anybody moving around, you have no ability to hear where it's going to come from, and you're just a sitting target waiting to get punched again. And that's how borderline personality disorder, that's how it may feel to the person in the relationship that doesn't understand what's going on. Think about it. When all the lights are out and you don't even know that anybody's there and you get punched in the face and you can't see anything and you can't hear anything and you're just waiting, what do you do? And so tonight I'm giving you the information to turn on that light and to be able to counterattack these situations or to be able to put it, define it, understand it, to help your relative, to help your spouse, to help your friend get some help 
or to ultimately realize that maybe it's time to exit stage right. So let's talk about more about those traits. And let's talk about these traits tonight because I think it's very interesting because these traits define impulsivity, passive aggression, lying. Lying is a big deal. Lying is a big thing for a borderline. They'll lie about almost everything. Stalking, stalking is a big deal too. If anybody that's uh, dated a borderline personality disorder, that's somebody that has that, they have probably been stalked. Now, either on Facebook or at their home, maybe countless text messages, emails. But the funny thing is, is that they have a flip-flop side. So they might go crazy and call you a million times and then for a month not even speak to you. Okay, And then when you see them again, they don't explain where they were. They don't offer explanation. They might make a joke about it, but that's about it. And if you ask them what was going on, they'll deflate it, they'll turn it on you, or they'll make a joke. You'll never get an answer to the reason why they took off. You'll just never get it. And if you want an answer, you'll you'll be there for the rest of your life waiting on an answer because they'll never give you one. Because there is no answer. They were right there the whole time. They just didn't choose to uh, to call you. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that later. Poor self-worth is a, is a big one, too. When, when people are dealing with borderline, they have poor self-worth. They have low self-worth. Because as a child, they had problems with self-worth. And it doesn't get any better unless you deal with it when you're an adult. If you avoid and you feel like you're worthless, you're going to always feel that way. And some of us have to get to the point where we seek help. Because a lot of us do have worth issues, okay? I think that's across the board for a lot of people. I think a lot of us don't feel like we're worthy, that we're good enough. Because we were kind of raised that way to believe that, or we were put down enough that we started believing it. Whatever it was, we felt like we were unworthy. What about drug and alcohol abuse? That's a big one. Drug and alcohol abuse, that's a big one, because a lot of borderlines don't want to really deal with reality, and they sure don't want to deal with love. So in the beginning of a relationship with a borderline, which is interesting, the relationship normally starts off hot and heavy. There's a lot of uh, intimacy and a lot of sex, and it's extremely good. And that's the thing is that the person that doesn't have borderline that's in this relationship gets all intertwined with, with the sex, And they don't realize that the sex is almost a game. It's really kind of a game to to totally get into your mind, to totally manipulate you and take over. And in their mind, when they're having sex with you, they're not, there's not, it's not a making love thing. Okay. It's a, I want to be the best. So this person never forgets me. So I am ingrained on their brain because when I take off, I'm going to make them hurt. Okay, think about it. So the sex is used as a weapon. It's used as a, as a technique for manipulation, for control, for power. And on the flip side, something I think is interesting is when it comes to a male component, someone that's a male a borderline, if he gets too romantically, as far as mindfully romantically inclined to some woman... Okay, so think about it. If a male borderline gets too close to a woman uh, mentally and emotionally before he has sex with her, when they do try to have sex, he won't be able to actually, um, you know, take it to the bank, so to speak. And, And there's a reason for that, too, because sex, again, has always been used as a control factor, It's always been used to produce the uh, so-called emotional connection, the so-called love. But when there's actual feelings, uh, the borderline doesn't even know what to do with it. And it's interesting because if a borderline really likes somebody and really actually might have feelings for them, they'll actually usually stop having sex with them, period. And will avoid them at all costs. If that makes sense. And we'll go more into that later on because I know that this sounds a little out of the box. But as you begin to listen to this and as you begin to put together the pieces, it might not have anything to do with you or anybody you know. But you might have a friend that you can see is going through turmoil because they are dating or married to a borderline. And they're doing the best they can to either keep the peace or to keep their brain intact. You know, I have a lot of male uh, borderline, a lot of male clients that have borderline wives. 
And one of the biggest things that they talk about is that they just try to be quiet. They try to be the best husband they can be. They try to be like the Leave it to Beaver family. Anything they can do to just not rock the boat. Because they know that she'll go off. And this has been going on for years, and they have children together, and they're trying to keep it all together, but yet they don't have much of a life. I mean, to sit there and realize that every day that you go home, every night that you go home, you know that you have to keep it together, be as quiet as you possibly can, be as quiet as a church mouse, and say as little as possible, that's not a life. That's not a marriage. I mean, what is that? And to have to do that for 5, 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, I have clients that have been doing this for 25 years, and they're counting down the days till their last child graduates high school so they can finally be free. Okay? This is excruciating. And I've dated a borderline before. I've actually dated three a long time ago. And all three of them... Wow. Oh, my Lord. And it was wild because all three of them were very interesting. Two of the three had, you know, very good jobs, highly employed, high education level. Um, You know, had brothers and sisters. Uh, all All of them were very quick to, when we met, it was just like a quick connection. Almost too quick, I would say, when I look back at it. And I overlooked a lot of things at the time. You know, the next thing would be that our relationship started hot and heavy. And it was it was like a Jedi mind trick. It's like every time we hung out and stuff, it was fun. But there was a lot of time in between where I didn't really know what was going on. And it seemed like there were two sets of rules. Like Ashley can do this. But the other person could do all that. And if I ever questioned what they were doing or what was going on, there was never either either no response, like I didn't deserve a response, or or I didn't I, I wasn't allowed to have a response, or they would kind of make a flippant joke about it. Like a flippant type eh, joke about it. Or they would just skim over it, or they would turn it around on me and be like, Well, you weren't around. Or you were all preoccupied. It was always something. And I'll tell you one thing is that I always knew that something was going on. I didn't really know what was happening, but I knew something was happening. And that's the thing that I'm talking about tonight is a lot of us watch CSI. Okay, some of us watch different type murder mystery films. But the concept of the murder mystery film is to figure out, okay, there was a murder. Who did it? Where is the murder weapon? Where do we find it? And when we watch these films, we normally get integrated with the fact that we want to know everything. When we think something's wrong in our relationship, we want to be able to pinpoint it. We want to be able to find the the bloody knife, in quotations. The bloody knife meaning what the other person's doing. Nail it down, know it, who they were hanging out with and what was going on. But when you're dealing with the borderline, you're never actually going to find the murder the murder weapon. In this case, the murder weapon would be whatever the borderline did that they don't want you to know about. And you're going to know that something's going on and you're going to feel that something's up, but you're not going to be able to define it. And you're going to try to hold out to look and to figure it out. But sadly enough, this is going to get you more in the system, in that blender, not knowing who you are and starting to second guess yourself. Stay tuned. We're going to be talking more about the traits of a borderline and what you need to know in this relationship to safeguard yourself. Stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. We'll be back this time in two shakes. This is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we're talking about borderline personality disorder, what you need to know, and how to safeguard yourself. You know, a lot of times we go into relationships, and we really don't understand. We don't really think about it. We're not we're not analyzing baggage. We're not really going through the most. We're kind of just like, man, we fell in love really quick. I have a lot of emotions for this person. And all of a sudden, one day, the hammer drops. And you're like, what the heck is going on here? I thought everything was okay. Now you're about to chop my head off. Well, when you're dealing with the borderline, you don't really ever know what's going on. It's hard to put your finger on the pulse of the situation. And like I was talking about earlier before the break, 
is that a lot of us watch these murder mystery shows where we watch these shows, we watch these dramas where we want to see, okay, who got murdered and now who murdered them, what do they murder them with and why do they murder them? Okay, we want to know all this information. The same applies when we were in a relationship. Think about it. You know something's going on behind your back, but you don't know what it is. I know there's something up. I know it, but I just can't figure it out. And so you try to find out, and you try to get clues, and you try to get more clues, and you try to get more clues, but the thing is is that you keep coming up with nothing because you don't have enough clues. And when you're dealing with a borderline personality disorder, when you're dealing with somebody that has this type of situation, you're never going to have enough clues. The borderline, that whole situation, creates all this other stuff. So, yes, there is something going on. Sure, you know that. But there could be 10, 15 things going on. At the same time, the borderline has borderline. Okay? And so that alone is going to have a lot of judgment being clouded because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know your head from your butt. Okay, and what happens when you're dealing with a borderline is you're dealing with like somebody that has a lack of empathy. Okay, so think about that empathy, a lack of empathy, the ability to feel. You're not with somebody that can feel. Okay, that's like top top deal right there is that in order to be with someone else that's a human being in any sort of relationship, you have to be around someone that can feel. And that can feel for you. Okay, not sympathy. Empathy. And a part of empathy is also love, if you think about it. And this means that it's almost almost like 99% that a person with borderline can't honestly love another person. Because they aren't able to because they don't love themselves. They self-loathe. Okay? And a lot of this came from mom and dad. So, for example, let's talk about this real quick. If you're dealing with a male borderline... He could be your boyfriend. He could be your spouse. Now, there are several things that could have happened with him and mom. Maybe mom wasn't getting enough attention from dad, and so she looked to her son to give her attention. Some of that attention could have been almost sexually oriented. And I'm not saying that she was, you know, sexually abusing her child, but I'm saying that it was a little flirtatious, a little on edge, not something, not the way that you act around a child. Another thing could be that she was not happy with her husband and would make comments about how awful her husband is, how awful his dad is. And so there's two things that the son can do. One, he can sit there and side with her and say he's awful. But the problem is, is that he's a product of the father. So if the dad's awful, then he's got to be awful. You think about that? Okay, on the flip side, he can be upset with mom for saying that and fight with that or can side. Now, for a son that was raised in a family when the father died or left and he sees his mom betting random men, lots of different men, if he walks in and sees that, okay, two things can happen. One, he thinks that mom is a a whore, okay? And he automatically defines her as so and hates her for it, okay? And in turn, sees all women that way and intentionally hates all women subconsciously. On the flip side, same scenario. Woman's, uh, the mother is uh, having a, a sexual intercourse with several different men, what have you. He sees it. Instead of categorizing mom as a whore, he categorizes mom as this is okay, Because instead of defining his mom, he decided if she's doing it, then this has got to be okay. So I'm going to okay her actions and make that okay. In the process of that, he grows up to be very sexually engaged with very with very many women. Okay, he gets sexually engaged with lots of women and he sees women more as a sexual object than anything else. See, there's a lot of options. There's more options, too. We'll talk about this later. Like, a daughter that's raised by a father that's either borderline or has these traits is more likely to date a man that has borderline because she's used to it. 
because she's used to those ups and downs. She's used to the, the lack of empathy. She's used to the impulsivity. She's used to the, the self-worth issues. She's used to the rageful outburst. She's used to it. And because she's so used to it, it's second nature. So, you know, girl meets a boy that sweeps her off her feet. It's a fast whirlwind relationship. And all of a sudden she's thrown into that ninja blender. But the thing is, the reason why she's there in the first place, because she's used to it. Okay. She's used to it. The interesting fact is that a lot of people will always say that the once they figure out that somebody's borderline, they always realize it. they consider it the best sex they ever had, but the absolute worst relationship they've ever, 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 ever been in. And the reason for that is, is that a borderline doesn't know how to love. They only know how to have sex. Okay. And if they start to feel love in parentheses and quotations about you, they will run as fast as they can because it's all about control and it's about power and it's about putting you down to raise them up and their self worth. And you might say, you might be one of these people because I know there's a lot of women and men out there. Y'all are caregivers. The caregivers, raise your hand. Even if you're driving, raise your hand. The caregivers, you're unique. And borderlines really go after you because guess what? You'll stick around longer than anybody else will because you think, you know what? I'll be the one that can save them. I'll be the one that can change them. I'll be the one that shows them that love is okay. I'll be the one that will break that shell and they will fall in love and happily ever after and they'll get over all the issues in their past and we'll move on together. And I would love to tell you, Savior, that this is going to work, caregiver. Sadly enough, it's going to pull you so far away from your center of gravity, you're not going to know who you are anymore. There'll be a time when if you finally remove yourself from this relationship, you'll go all over the universe, you know, praying about how God helped you because it will take you at least, depending on how long you've been in the relationship, if you've been in the relationship more than a year, two years, it might take you a whole year to get over it. Because it is a mental, emotional, Jedi mind trick that borderlines do to people because that's what they know. That's what they use. And so some of the other traits include having affairs, Drug and alcohol use. Now, affairs, that's to make them feel better because more people want them, okay? Because they don't have self-love, and so they actually have self-loathe. They loathe themselves. And so now, if more people li- like them and they're into more people, then that's great. They'll do a lot of flirtation as well around the office. And it may, they might flirt with somebody for 10 years and never actually follow through, but they like the fact that somebody actually is thinking about them. And it's funny, they might even flirt with somebody and eventually when the time comes where they actually have to make some sort of action, they'll run away from it. They'll stop calling, they won't be around, and they'll stop the flirting pretty quickly. You know, also extramarital affairs, but also rageful outbursts. Rageful outbursts are a big deal because there's a lot of rage. There's from extremes. And there's a lot of outbursts and yelling and screaming that comes out for no reason i mean you sit there and you check yourself and you go well, did it, was there something i said was there something i did but when you really realize it it had nothing to do with you okay you're the scapegoat though but it had nothing to do with you so stay tuned when we return we're going to be talking more about the borderline traits and then later on in the next hour what you can do to deal with it or move on so stay tuned because perspectives with your host me ashley burgess will be back in we'll be back this time in two shakes you could be my luck. Get in here. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight we're talking about borderlines, borderline personality disorder, and what that means. You know, a lot of times in life, we meet somebody that we get engrossed with very quickly. We get enmeshed with very quickly. We have a fast whirlwind relationship where, wow, it's the best sex we've ever had. Everything seems great. And then all of a sudden, bam, the hammer falls. Dr. Jekyll, Mrs. Hyde, or Mr. Hyde shows up. You don't know who's going to show up either day. You don't know what to say or what to do because it seems that no matter what you say or what you do, they're going to yell at you. 
And off and on, you'll get glimpses of hope where maybe they're just going through a phase. Maybe it's just stress at work. Maybe it's just family issues. And then you start going through this stuff and you start wondering. But eventually, as the years pass, if you're still in it, you realize it's not just a phase. And tonight we've been talking about borderline personality disorder and the traits of a borderline. And so we've talked about impulsivity. We've talked about passive aggression. We've talked about lying and stalking, the lack of empathy. Empathy is a big deal. That's also uh, defined directly to love. You can't be imp- If you can't be empathic, you really can't love somebody, honestly. Poor self-worth, drug and alcohol abuse, extramarital affairs, rageful outbursts, depression and suicidal ideation. So think about that. A lot of depression there. And that's why a lot of times borderline gets defined wrong. It, it Basically, they see a patient, so patients will come in and they have depression, and so they automatically say they have depression. But they don't take a look at the other extenuating circumstances, and so they put them on depressant medication, but it doesn't work. And that's why a lot of people who are married to spouses who have depression and they've been on medication, they go, we don't know what's going on. They've been on medication for five years. They've changed their medication every six months. Nothing's working. Well, you know what? They've been misdiagnosed. Okay, and it could be borderline personality disorder. And that's what you need to know, because if it is, maybe they can get some help or you can also figure out what to do and you can get some help, too. What about the inability to hold on to difficult emotions and the ability? I'm sorry, the inability to self soothe, you know, because a lot of times we we take it for granted, the ability for us to kind of deal with our own issues, to have emotions that we deal with, because most of us deal with stuff on a daily basis. And we take it for granted that we're able to deal with that. But some people can't. They aren't able to. They have self-harming behaviors, sometimes accident prone. Cognitive disorder, projections, they have that splitting, that I love you, that hate you concept. And that's a big deal, too. That's one of the biggest, 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 biggest traits of a borderline is the I love you, I hate you. Within the same hour, within the same minute, they can love you and they can hate you, and you have no idea why it changes. Seriously. They've written books on it. One book is called I Love You, I Hate You, Don't Leave Me. I Hate You, Don't Leave Me. And I read that book. It's on borderline personality disorder, but it was very questionable because the problem was it never really defined it. And so there were even more questions and answers when I read that. I thought it was a good take on it, and I liked the title, but I thought they could have gone a little further when they were really defining it. They're physically uh, volatile. They're violent. They are very big into rebound relationships. They can have some OCD and some anxiety. They self-sabotage themselves. And they have an incapacity to want you Unless they can't have you. And let me define that real quick because this is a big deal. Because borderlines like the idea of being with somebody that they can't really necessarily be with. So either the married person that they that they like, the person that lives on the other side of the of the globe, think about it, or their ex. A lot of times borderlines are still in love with their exes, their ex-wives, their ex-husbands. And the thing about it is, is that the love is kind of, it's not really a real love, but that's all they can think about because it can't really be attached to anything that they can be actually attached to. Think about it. And so a lot of borderlines go around their whole life thinking about the one that got away. And the one that got away, there's probably a lot of issues there, but the thing is that they're unattainable. They're unattainable, but they'll go through their whole life thinking about that person. There's a lot of extreme jealousy as well. A lot of narcissism being bigger than life. And the extreme jealousy thing is interesting, too, because they're extremely jealous of anybody they're with. And when the the person they're with literally almost has to give up their life as far as a life outside of them. Because they're extremely jealous. But on the flip side, the person that's dating them can give up their life, but the borderline won't. 
and will maybe go out several nights in a row and never even say where they were or what they were doing. As long as you're at their beck and call, though, it's okay. And the funny thing about it is, is the more you're at their beck and call, the less they want you. So if you're actually there and a good person and care, they don't really want you that much. And what kind of relationship is that? Think about it. It's like the whole idea of, well, I'm not going to call her for four days. And then when she calls me, though, I'm not going to respond for X amount of time. It's like, what is up with the game plan? And if you love game playing and you like it as a sport and you don't mind getting emotionally screwed up in the head, date or marry a borderline. Because this is the ultimate game plan. This is the ultimate mind game play. Okay? Because you won't know what's happening. This will be the game of a century for you, and it will last your whole life, and it will be difficult to get out of it. I mean, because the borderline concept is a lot of codependency, but there's also a lot of selective memory. Think about it. They're very quick to not think about something that they've done, but to think about the problems with you. Okay? They'll find problems with you. And also, their memory is very selected. So depending on what they've done, they might not remember that, but they'll remember everything that you did that they're not happy with. And I think a lot of people can relate to this and is starting to think about it in their own backyard when it comes to a relative or when it comes to a friend or somebody they're in love with or been in love with or somebody they're currently married to. Is that you're never getting anything right. Okay? You're the problem. See? And you... You don't know why, because you've done everything you can, you've done everything right, but you're still the problem. And by the way, they'll let you know about it every single second they can. You know, a lot of times it's control issues, and that's a big deal, is that a lot of this is all based on control. I'm going to start outbursts, I'm going to get rageful, because I'm controlling you, okay? I'm going to control you to get meek, to get quiet, to lose your personality, to come home and walk on eggshells and better hope that I don't yell at you. That's what this is. Also, there's a lot of blackouts, not remembering what was going on. And that's also an easy way out too. And and I know that there are blackouts and it happens, but it's like you can't ever put your finger on things. You're held to a higher standard than they ever are, even though they'll point out all your flaws. For all you women out there, if you're with a borderline male, you will never feel tall enough, you will never feel thin enough, you will never feel busty enough, okay? For all you men with borderline females, you'll never be a good enough caretaker, you'll never be a good enough breadwinner, you'll never be tall enough, you'll never be successful enough. You're never enough. It's never, ever, ever enough. And you will always try to get their admiration. And you will never, ever get it. And do you see the combination of the reason why people get into borderline personality disorders and with people like that? It's because they're used to trying to get the same thing from their parents. They're used to trying to get that same thing. Like in a borderline, when, when you're a male and you're with a borderline female, you just want her to sit there and say, honey... I'm so proud of you. You've done such a great job. You're such a great caregiver. You're such a great breadwinner. You're totally successful. And I appreciate every, appreciate every single thing you do for the family. Except for you're never going to get that. You're never going to get that. And you never got that with your family either. Okay? So whether it was your mom or your dad saying, hey, son, you did really great. You didn't get it. And so you're looking for it, and someone else is not going to give their approval either. And that's a big deal is approval, okay? And that's something that a borderline will hold over your head. They'll never give you approval, and they'll never give you a compliment. You will never get a compliment. And if you do, it has to do with something totally different, and you better watch your back. So stay tuned. When we return, we'll be talking more about borderline personality disorder, the traits, but also how you can deal with certain situations that happen and how to move on. So stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in, be back this time in two shakes. You're in a good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we're talking about borderline personality disorder, what it is, what it means, and what you need to know to safeguard yourself. 
You know, I talked about this earlier that, you know, that song by Madonna, Over the Borderline, that's exactly about borderline personality disorder. It's about dealing with someone that has the traits of being very passive aggressive, having depression, self-loathing, you know, having a splitting type personality, loving you and hating you in the same moment, dealing with a personal sabotage and the incapacity to want you unless they can't have you, as well as extreme jealousy, narcissism, being grandiose, selective memory recall, black or white thinking. And this is a big deal because it's like it's everything or nothing. You know, also at the same time, they can have verbal exhibitionism, meaning that they'll talk about sexual things verbally that can actually make you feel very uncomfortable. And it's almost like they do it on purpose. And the weird thing about when you're dealing with the borderline is that when they start doing this, instead of just getting up and leaving, you don't. You sit through it. You sit through it because it's a game being played. And a lot of these times when that is being said, they're actually playing with your emotions. Because that usually means that you've gotten under their skin and they're not planning on having sexual relationships with you. But they're going to be intriguing and to hold the carrot And by the time after the dinner, after you've gotten done and that person's been talking like that, they'll go home. It's all about power. It's all about control. And that's what's an interesting concept. So if you've recently been on a date and y'all have been having sex and having a relationship and what have you, and then all of a sudden the other starts talking some very sexual type talk at the table... And you're thinking, okay, well, I guess this is where this is going. And the next thing you're like, good night. You're probably dealing with the borderline. Think about also eating disorders, emotional blackmail, disassociation. Also kind of just being sporadic and a lot and very rigid at the same time. And the funny thing about it is they're normally attracted to inaccessible women or men or also long term or long distance romances. And I think this is interesting because when we look at this type of concept, a lot of times we can find ourselves in a game playing type phase. Like this is a relationship where there's a lot of game playing going on. There's a lot of game playing. You don't really know where you stand. For example, let's say that you're a woman, okay, and you've been dating uh, this man on and off. And let's say that he made plans with you about a week or more in advance, okay? Made plans with you. Let's go out Saturday night. We'll go out to dinner. We'll do this stuff. And you're like, oh, that's great. So you're waiting for it. You go through the work week. And, you know, Friday you get some rest because you know that you're going to be seeing them on Saturday. Kind of looking forward to it. Well, you're really looking forward to it, right? But you're trying to keep it on the down low. But he never, he's never firmed, uh, firmed it up. He's never called you. He's never texted you throughout the week to say anything. But you kind of just figure that maybe... You know, y'all make it on Saturday. Everybody's kind of busy. And so you're kind of sitting around wondering what to wear for the occasion. And you're thinking, yeah, he's going to call soon, I'm sure, to to fine-tune our date. And then you start to think maybe he's forgotten about it. Because you haven't heard from him. And you're like, huh. And then, you know, the time passes for the date. It was 7 o'clock and... Y'all are talking about getting together, and in the past, he's always come to pick you up at your house or at your condo or apartment. And you kind of go, well, maybe he's just been busy. He'll be here. That was 7 o'clock. At 8.30, you realize, nope, he's not showing up. And this stuff's intentional, by the way. Nobody really thinks or forgets that they had a date plan on Saturday, do you think? And do you think that they go through the whole week forgetting to call you? Think about it. If a guy is excited about a, about somebody, they'll go the extra mile to make certain that they're still on the same page for Saturday night because they're looking forward to seeing you. And anything else outside of that is pure, not pure, it's adulterated manipulation. Anything outside of that is manipulation. To not call, to not firm updates, to make the whole agreement, to not catch up, And to leave the person hanging is all intentional. And it's funny that if you're the woman and you actually call him to see where he stands or call to see what's going on, he's actually learning how much bad behavior he can honestly get away with and what you'll tolerate. 
And guess what? It sets the tone for the future of what's to follow. I mean, you know, honestly, I've been in that situation before. Back when I was in the dating scene before I've been married, I dated three different borderlines. And it wasn't until the last few years that I was able to really diagnose and understand exactly what was going on. However, in all those occasions, during some part of our relationship, they would make plans, talk about it, say how great it's going to be, and then two days before it, I would not hear anything. And then the day of or the night of, I would just expect everything to be as it usually is where they come by and pick you up or whatever. No, they don't show up. They don't show up. It might be several days after until you hear from them. And they never talk about where they were and they never even bring it up. This is manipulation. And if you call them on it to see if they're okay, because God forbid, there's got to be something wrong. I mean, they must be dead. They must have been hit or killed on the highway, right? Because something must have happened. Don't you love that when you don't hear from somebody and everybody goes, oh, have you checked the hospital? You think they're dead? No, they're not dead. They're just not calling you. Solid manipulation. So your brain automatically goes to something bad happened when in reality, he's out doing whatever he wants to do. He might even be sitting at home laughing. And you play right into the hand. Are you okay? Think about it. And and, and what we should have been doing, what I should have been doing is saying, oh, that's it. But when you're dealing with a borderline, you are so messed up in the head emotionally because they literally, everything that's up is down, down is up. You start feeling like a caretaker, caregiver, and also the sex is good. So this spirals everything together and you just play right into the hand again. You play right on into that same hand again. And that's the thing is that they start realizing what you'll tolerate. And they like to deal with people that are more pushovers because they can take away all their power. Now, if they actually end up getting on a date and going out with consecutively somebody that does have power, power in their field, power emotionally, that kind of thing, they'll try to break you down hardcore. Okay? It's almost like you've just entered a cult. They will try to take you down and break you down as much as they possibly can and leave you with nothing. Nothing. But the sex was good. So think about it. And a lot of times when we deal with a borderline, we deal with hypocrisy. We deal with hypocrisy. And that's what keeps us confused and off-center. Because you get used to it by now that whatever you do is not okay, and whatever they do is fine. And and they're going to ask you a lot of questions about... You're if you're being genuine, if you're being honest, but when it comes to asking them questions, they don't tolerate that. That's not tolerated. Not part of the deal. It's like they literally want you to be naked, quote, naked mentally and emotionally while they are completely guarded and completely hidden on every level. And that's something that we have to know is that when we're dealing with borderlines, this isn't you going crazy. This is you dealing with the situation and you're dealing with somebody that doesn't have the capacity to actually honestly love. And we have to sit there and get out of the caregiver mode and realize that we have to give care to ourselves. Because in this relationship, if you don't care for yourself, no one else will. No one else will because it's really crazy. It's a scary relationship. It's scary because you're out there with a wing and a prayer and you're going to be taken down piece by piece. And so when we return to me talking more about the traits of a borderline and how to kind of understand where you stand, why you got there in the first place and how to start moving on, stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. Be back in two shakes. Turn it up and jump in the deep end on Perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. You know, I know about at this point that some of y'all are saying, hey, my radar is pretty sharp. My radar is pretty sharp, and I have a good beat on things. But I'll tell you one thing. When we're dealing with borderline, it's hard. I mean, your radar might be sharp when it comes to almost everything, but except when you're falling for a borderline, because this guy or this gal in the beginning seems so wonderful. You can almost hardly believe it that you found another person 
That's so cool and so awesome. It's like you've been wishing for this kind of connection for absolute ever, and now it's finally here. But you know, honestly, as this relationship progresses, you're going to feel increasingly frustrated, you're going to feel confused, and you're going to be ultimately tormented. You know, because this guy or this gal that was fantastically open and interesting keeps shutting you out, and you end up painfully longing and yearning for the way it was in the beginning. This is one of those relationships where it's interesting how the beginning was the best of the best of the best it'll ever be. That was it. That was it because it swept you off your feet. You're like, man, this is what I was looking for the whole time. Oh, this is great. Can't believe this. This is what I wanted. And a lot of it is fantasy. The fantasy of the relationship. The fantasy that... This person that you've been looking for for a long time with these traits actually exist. And the sex is amazing and the connection and the chemistry is amazing and all this stuff's amazing until they shut you out. And they will ultimately shut you out. And the interesting thing is that instead of like being shut out and then us walking away, we, we, we try to get in contact. We try to get their attention. We do whatever we can. And that could take a day, that could take a week, that could take a month, that could take a year. You get back in it again, you start all over again. It's crazy, it's cool, it's it's tormenting. But yet, then you go through the whole process again, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it. Some people do this for a lifetime. I mean, it's it's unhealthy because it's taking your will to live. I mean, this is like having another job, but an emotionally and mentally and physically draining job. Because you never know what's happening. You know, and it's funny because when we talk about male borderlines, they're more likely to choose or select a woman that he honestly perceives as being needy or less powerful than he is. You know, think about it. Any woman that's really honestly whole to him, like a whole person, or has maybe greater resources than he has, or is recognized higher than he is, Think about that. That activates his abandonment fears. The fear of being abandoned. Okay? Because the control factor is not there. Because if he does choose a partner who's relatively sound, who's relatively healthy, he's going to systematically tear her down and make her question her own worth. And think about it. In this way, he's always in the driver's seat. And the abandonment concerns are averted. Because the thing is, is that they've learned this from a child. They don't want to be abandoned. They have abandonment issues. And when I was talking about my family member, the family member I was talking about was abandoned by their parents. And I can kind of see some of the situation. Because they have a tendency of seeing things very black and white. And, and this person in particular make snap judgments like like that. Like if somebody does something that they don't find right, they'll cut them out. They'll cut them right out. And it could even be a family member. They'll just cut out. They won't talk to them. They'll stop communication with them. They'll cut them completely out of their life. And I've seen this person do that countless times. They even did it to me for a while. They even did it to me for over five years. And, and think about it. It's like I've and, and I've realized it now when I sit back and I look at it, it's, it's textbook borderline. You know, when a parent abandons a child at an early age, that child knows abandonment. That child knows what it feels to be abandoned. And guess what? That child never wants to feel that again. And so instead of later on down the road working through it, just never want to deal with it. They'll run from abandonment. They'll run from relationship to relationship. They'll do a lot of extramarital affairs just because it makes them feel better about themselves. Because sex is kind of like a glory deal. And, you know, they're going to see things very black and white when it comes to other people. They're not going to look at what they're doing, but they're going to look at what everybody else does and make decisions based on that. And when you're dealing with a borderline, you're dealing with a lot of that. They make a lot of decisions on other people. They make a lot of snap decisions based on whatever. And those are the same things that they could get away with doing, but it's not right for that person to be doing it. 
And because they're doing it, they're no longer in the borderline in the borderline's life, and they will just let them go. And it could even be a relative, a family member, even a child. Even children can get cut out of borderline's lives. It's interesting, too, because when you're in love with a narcissistic male or female, you're never going to feel good enough. You're never going to be good looking. You're never going to be smart enough. You're never going to be tall enough. Okay. And they may not actually convey their disdain or disappointment directly to you. Okay. They might not, but you're always going to feel inadequate. You're always going to feel inadequate. For example, I remember something. It's almost like it feels like it happened yesterday, but it happened like 14 years ago. Isn't that funny how things happen? And I was I was out. Well, maybe it was like 15 years ago. <laughs> maybe it was longer than that. Okay, I'm not going back any further. Got it? No more aging on this deal. But I was with somebody I was dating, and, and they happened now that I realized years later that they were borderline. Still are. Nothing's changed. And I remember we were out on a date one day. And we're walking down the street, and this this woman walks by, and she's probably in like six or seven hill, uh, six or seven inch stiletto heels. I mean, I couldn't wear, wear those on a good day. <laughs> and uh, you know, he made it, and she had blonde hair. And I remember him making a comment about how gorgeous this woman was, and then looked at me in just a certain way, and made some comment about how I was more like a kid. And, I mean, that is one of the most painful feelings to be walking down the street. I was, You know, everybody's a little insecure to some degree. And then you have somebody pointing out somebody going, whoa, wow, she's beautiful. And she's got it all. Oh, yeah, she's hot. Look at those legs. Mm. Oh. And there I am in, like, flip-flops. And then he looks back at me in a certain way. And you know what? Oh, my gosh. Talk about feeling inadequate. I mean, he didn't have to sit there and say, oh, you're not tall. You're short. Oh, oh, you're not this, you're that. No, no, he didn't have to say anything, but he made me feel completely inadequate. And I think that a lot of people listening can resonate with what I just talked about. Think about it. And, you know, it's funny because the truth of it, the, the real truth of it is that the borderline is insecure at their core. He's, he or she is so insecure at the core that they have to throw a shroud. They have to throw a shroud around your flame to make theirs glow a little brighter. Do you see what I'm saying? They have to dampen your flame to ignite theirs. And so they're going to put you down in certain ways. They're going to make you feel small because they need to power up. And it's funny because they probably won't ever compliment you. But you're going to know your imperfections and you're going to know your deficits. You're going to know those clearly. There's going to be like an almanac of them. You know, there'll be like a a separate treaty uh, of your imperfections and deficits. And you're going to know it. You're going to know it. You're going to know exactly what it is. But they're never going to compliment you. And if they do, it's rare. And if they do, there's a reason behind it. And it's probably not good. But I've even dated. I've had. I've been around people in my past where you could have, you could have done it. You could have come up with Wikipedia. You could have invented Google, and they will never compliment you for anything. You could have come up with a cure for cancer, no compliment, no hey, good job, nothing. And they always downplay everything you do, and they always make you feel lesser. And I have another example too, and this might hit home with some of y'all. Because it's hit home with some of my patients that we've talked about this too. So one time, years and years and years ago, I used to be a, a professional photographer for a little bit of time. Well, for a long time. It was like my career when I was young, when I was going through college. And I was dating somebody and I took some amazing pictures. And some of those pictures I had I had developed. I had a, I had a little, little camera at the time. A little Canon, what have you. You know, a Canon 35 millimeter. And, and there were some beautiful, beautiful pictures. And I remember, you know, some of my friends going, man, I really, really want some of those. And, and I, I was like, oh, yeah. And I remember I was dating somebody and I was like, you know, I want to I want to impress them on their birthday. And so I took three of the most amazing pictures I had that I mean, I can't even tell you how many people complimented me on those pictures. Please, can I have them in my house? Hey, man, you know, can, can I frame those and put those in my house? And I gave them to the guy I was dating. And he looked at me he's like, oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> It's not really my style and all, but yeah, that's cool. 
That was it. For all I know, I think I think he threw him away. And that's how you feel around a borderline is nothing you do is good enough. Whether it's your pictures, whether it's your poetry, whether it's your cooking, still not good enough. And they'll never compliment you, and you'll always feel lesser. And the funny thing is, is that when you start spending time with other people, like, you're appreciated, and you don't know how to deal with it. Like, they're asking you how you're doing. They actually care about how you feel. They actually say, hey, you're awesome, or hey, I love your cooking, or hey, you're really good at the kitchen. This is awesome stuff here. What is that? You don't even know how to deal with it because you haven't had a compliment in so long. You don't even know what's going on. You think they're up to something. So stay tuned when we return. We'll be talking more about how to deal with the borderline and how to figure out if you're in the borderline relationship and what you can do about it. Stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in, be back this time in two shakes. This is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we've been talking about being in a relationship with a borderline, what borderline personality disorder is, and we're going to begin to talk about a little bit of the issues, but also what you might be able to do about it. You know, before we really get into all that, I want to talk about the reason why these relationships can be so difficult to get out of and difficult to overcome, is that in the beginning, a borderline can be the best lover you've ever had. Literally, the woman or the man borderline wants you to dream of him and put them on a pedestal. And it's funny because that's what they want. It's not about making love. It's about putting them on a pedestal because they're the best ever. And you'll always judge everybody compared to them. And it's interesting. And it's part of their bonding ritual. And especially men are typically get their feelings through sex, and it's part of their bonding ritual. And you know what? If, if, if a borderline male, if the order is reversed, and instead of having sex prior to getting to know his prey, I mean his woman, he might not be able to get it up. Because in short, the more you actually matter to him, the less he's able to perform, and vice versa. And we saw that in a recent film back in 2011, Shame. I actually saw the premiere at the American Film Institute at Ming's at Man's Chinese Theater uh, for the AFI uh, Film Festival. And I remember it was just an extreme film. It's called Shame. But it's true, and it really showed and depict the sexual prowess of a borderline male and what really goes down. And it's like you really don't know what's going on. And I think it's interesting because contrary to popular belief, you know, both the male and the female borderline, they're not actually compulsively drawn to sex. And they actually might withhold or be aloof to your feelings for uh, for contact, honestly. Because it's really more about seduction. It's more about seducing you into a situation to getting you in there for you to have a whirlwind of experiences, for you to almost lose yourself in the process, and then all of a sudden they leave you there, and you don't know what to do. Think about it. And anybody that's been in a relationship like this knows exactly what I'm talking about. Think about it. And and it's interesting, too, that you have to sit there and realize that a lot of times they also want to practice different types of sexual interests. And some of those things can actually make you feel a little insecure. Some of those things are antithetical to your beliefs. But what do you do? Do you stand up for yourself? No. And that's the key is that you got to be aware of once you're aware of this person and once you're aware of the strategy and once you realize that this is borderline and once you realize this is control. It's no longer something that you can save and change. It's something that you need to save yourself from, okay? Because if they're not willing to go to treatment and they're not willing to go to get therapy, then you don't need to be willing to stick in this because this is a death, mentally emotional death sentence for you, okay? You might as well take on something else because this is a big deal. Do something that's good for society. Give back to society. Seriously. And it's interesting because the male or female borderline can come across as very charismatic. They're very seductive. The females' borderlines are usually not powerful 
they're almost like the damsel in distress. They need help because they had a bad relationship last time and they were abused. And you'll hear about how awful the man was and how awful he was. And you'll want to save her because that's what you are. You are the savior. You've come in on your on your white horse with your sword and you're going to save the poor little damsel in distress. However, you don't realize that she's going to eat your face. She's going to eat you up and spit you out for lunch. And you have you don't even have an idea because you're not even thinking about that. You're not even ready for it because you have no idea this is about to happen. And the thing is, is that you don't even realize that what she's talking about from her previous mail about the abuse and everything, when y'all break up or when y'all get divorced, she'll be telling everybody else about how you abused her. And you didn't abuse her. You were mentally and emotionally raped. Okay? But the way that she sees it versus the reality, totally two different things. When it comes to the male borderline, they're very seductive and they can seem very powerful. And those are characteristics that are especially attractive to female borderlines or attractive to any woman for that matter. You know, and on the other side, it's funny, on the other side... Just like kind of like the female borderline, there will be men that will be very humble, very disempowered, almost like a victim. And it's interesting because I've heard this concept before in in a long essay that I read recently on borderline. And it was like either they're Superman or they're like the wave. It's either one or the other. They're either like bigger than life or they're the victim. And in the borderline case of the woman, it's normally the victim. She normally plays herself as the victim, the, just the girl that just needs a hand, that needs some help. She's just a sweetheart. She's great in bed. And then all of a sudden, Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde shows up. And it's interesting, too, because when you have this waif side when it comes to the male borderline, he'll talk about his boyhood wounds. And it's interesting because you'll try to stop. You'll try not to step on emotional landmines. But these things are in his past. And there's nothing you can say. You could could say something that was just random that will set him off. And you're probably going to want to be like a totally different female than the ones that he grew up with. But that doesn't fit his emotional profile. See, he's found you because you remind him of something from his childhood. If you go and become the opposite of that, that's not what he's looking for because he's used to what he dealt with. And it's funny because most people, just like just like the waif male borderline, is very used to being comfortable and very familiar with drama and neglect. It's what feels normal to him. It's what feels easy to him. It's what he's used to. And it's interesting because it's kind of like um, it's kind of paradoxical. The more you love him, the less he loves you. You know, it's almost like when you're younger and you're kids and you're dating or you're whatever in high school or college, your first couple of relationships. And it's like the closer you get, the more the other person pushes you away. The more you push the other person away, the closer they get. Well, that's very similar to borderline. Okay. But it's constant. And so you have to play a game of being aloof or not being available to get their attention. For example, Instead of meeting them for dinner to pick something up, you have to sit there and say, hey, I'll come by your front desk and pick it up. Take care. Have a great week. The next thing you know, they're going to be calling you and calling you and calling you and calling you and setting up a date and you're going to be hanging out because they want to know what the heck you're up to because they don't have a finger on you right now. And it's funny, like when we deal with borderlines a lot, we have a tendency of playing racquetball with them for no reason. It's like eventually don't hit the ball back over the net. Okay, and let's talk about that right now because I think this is important. Once you realize, because I think that you know by now, from all the traits and all the stuff we've been talking about tonight, you know whether or not you're in a relationship with a borderline or not. Because some of this stuff is rang so true that you probably either swerved off the road or you fell out of your chair at home. Okay, because it's a big deal. And a lot of y'all were thinking that you were on this planet alone and you had no idea what to do. Stressed out, have no idea what's going on, completely not understanding and wondering, are you the only person on this planet going through this? Is this your pain and your agony to carry for the rest of your life or is this ever going to get any better? 
Well, now that you realize that you're with a borderline, now you can decide what you want to do. Because these are important facts, because you have to figure out, even if you're a fixer or you're a rescuer, you got to figure out what you're going to do, because you got to rescue yourself at some time. You know, on the airplane, they always tell you to put the oxygen mask on your face prior to putting it on your child. And the reason why they say that is because if you don't have oxygen and you can't figure out what to do, you're going to pass out before you can help the child. <laughs> okay? Right now, you're in this position, but you've put the oxygen mask on the borderline. And the borderline's cut your cord already. There's no oxygen for you. Okay, so you either got to steal that face mask back or you got to get off that plane. So what are you going to do? And so I know a lot of y'all are listening saying, well, heck, I'm in a marriage. I'm in a, I'm in a long-term marriage and I've been dealing with this for a long time. Uh, you know, I've been dealing with this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. What am I supposed to do? Well, how much longer do you want to deal with this? How much longer are you ready to deal with this? And has your spouse seen any sort of therapist? Have they seen therapists? And have they been misdiagnosed? Because I think the first thing is that they're willing to get therapy and they're willing to go in to get treated. And this is a very difficult treatment because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of breaking down and it takes a lot of being naked for them that they're not used to because they've hidden for so long. Because they've controlled everybody around them for so long, okay? that they haven't been out there in the limelight. Now it's your turn to push them into the light to figure out what's up. If they're willing to get treatment and they're willing to actually go, you might be able to keep this marriage. God bless you. You're going to have to go to treatment for PTSD because you have been beaten down so much. Your stress level is at an all-time high. Your nerves are shot. You're constantly walking on eggshells when you're at home. You're constantly walking on eggshells not knowing what to say. You can't even be yourself in your own home, and you haven't been in 10 years. Okay? You haven't been. And whether the sex's still going or if that left a long time ago, you got nothing. You're over there just dealing with hell every day you get home. I mean, your job looks better and better no matter what you do. Think about it. If your spouse is willing to get treatment, you got something there. But you got to be consistent and you got to make sure they go every single week. And depending on how bad the the borderline is, it needs to be a couple times a week. And I specialize in that. That's something I'm very good at. But this is deep psychotherapy. And it has to be taken care of because it goes to the root of being accepted and self-worth and love. And if somebody can't love themselves, they can't love you. So stay tuned when we return to be talking more about what you can do if you're currently in a relationship with a borderline. Stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in, be back in two shakes. You could be my luck. Get in here. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight we've been talking about borderline personality disorder what it means to be borderline. And now we're talking about what to deal with, what to do if you're in a relationship with a borderline. And right before the break, I was talking about if you're in a marriage and you've been married for a long period of time, and as of tonight, listening to the show, you realize that your spouse has borderline personality disorder. First thing you can do is talk to them about getting treatment. If they are in treatment and they've been misdiagnosed, which a lot of people are, then y'all have to go in. You have to sit there and work with it, and go into complete deep psychotherapy. This is something that has to be dealt with because they don't actually know, or they don't have the capability of actually really truly loving someone. And you're going to go through hell and back trying to save this person. So if they're willing to go through treatment, that's great. More power to you. They're stepping up to the plate, and that's a good thing. If they're not willing to go through treatment and they don't want to listen to you, you've got to sit back and figure out what makes sense for you. And I understand that some of y'all will say, hey, I got married and I got married to have one marriage. I didn't get married to get divorced. Okay, I don't want to be a divorcee. Well, you got to sit back and look at it and say, how well and how happy are you going to be in your life to deal with this day in and day out? You've already dealt with this for X amount of years. Are you willing to continue to deal with this? Is this helping and aiding in the quality of your life? Because if it is, great, but I don't think it is. If your kids have already grown and they're out of the house then what's the deal? Even if your kids aren't out of the house, why would you want to live in a relationship that you are walking on eggshells and you can't be yourself with and there's complete turmoil in that family? Think about it. Because the kids know. 
Okay, don't fool yourself. The kids know. Even if you're not yelling in front of each other anymore because you figured out how to be quiet and how to be whatever she wants you to be or whatever he wants you to be, the kids still know. Okay? They're not stupid. They might not know consciously, but subconsciously they know. And so even if you moved out and you got your own place, you could still have joint custody of your children. And and some of y'all will say, well, I don't want my wife or husband, that's the borderline, around them so much because I don't want it to rub off. Well, you got to take your chances and spend as much time with your kids as you possibly can. Okay? There's no easy answer for that except for if you were to take full custody. But if, but if it's your wife that's borderline, that's, pro- that's hard to prove in court, and also it's hard to deal with that. And do you really not want your wife seeing the kids or vice versa? But the big deal is, is that if they are borderline and they're not willing to get treatment, you've got to step up to the plate. And you've got to figure out how to make sure that those kids grow up being able to understand what love is and being able to understand what empathy is and what honest emotion is and what dealing with their emotions really means. Because that's so important to a child. So if you're married right now, think about it. Even if you're being, even if you are being the Ozzy and Harriet, even if you're being the Leave it to Beaver family, and you're pulling that off just to keep the peace, think about it. Are you willing to do this for the rest of your life? Because if you are, is that being a saint, or what's the reason for it? And a lot of times it's excuses. I don't want to do this because the kid, I don't want this. Well, it's because you're wrapped up in the life of the borderline, okay? And to a degree, your ego tells you that you can change this person. Your ego's over there telling you, oh, yeah, yeah, I got this covered. Just give it another year, one more year, and we'll have it. One more year, and we'll have him or we'll have her where I want her. And she'll stop being like that, or he'll stop being like this, and I will finally, finally be right. Well, you know what? That's not going to happen either. And so we have to sit back and say, okay, out of all this stuff, what makes sense? And so if you're married, you've got to sit back and acknowledge. And I would actually say to go see a therapist if you want to come see me or you would like me to to uh, I have other therapists that I work with. I can help you with that as well. And you've got to sit down and talk about the pros and cons and what you want to do, because in life, life is too short to live in a marriage where you can't be yourself, to live in a marriage where you have to walk on eggshells every single night when you get home and you beg to go back to work. And you hope and pray that your wife or husband goes out of town for a few days so you can have some peace and quiet. But while they're out of town, you're just over there trying to lick your wounds because you are so beaten down and so abused that you can't figure out the forest from the trees that you got to get away. This is a toxic deal here. Okay, for everybody out there who's listening, who is in a relationship but not married to a borderline, get out now. Get out now. Don't let your ego get in the way. If you're a male, don't sit there and say, oh, she's the damsel in distress. I can save her. I'll be the only man on the planet to save her because all those other men were evil, evil men that abused her and took abuse of her, of my little angel. Wrong. Wrong. If your little angel is a black widow spider, then that's your little angel. But that is not an angel. But she's fooled you, and you've allowed her to fool you, and you want to believe whatever you want to believe. On the flip side, for all you women out there with a borderline male, stop, look, and listen, because you got to watch out for these. Big time. Not only will they berate you and make you feel bad, but on top of that, they are sleeping with a lot of folks. They are. You got to be very careful. And they're very impulsive, so the idea of using protection is probably not on the top of their radar. Seriously. The other thing is that there's a lot of shame involved. When you're dealing with somebody that has borderline, they cause a lot of toxic shame. That's kind of the key word jargon that you hear a lot. And when you're dealing with that, you're going to start having personal shame because you are going to not like yourself because you're going to completely keep morphing yourself and changing yourself To fit in for the borderline. And eventually when they throw you away. Or when you're still there. But you can't stand up. You have a lot of pieces to put together. And you're going to have to find yourself again. And that can take a lot of psychotherapy. It can. And I don't want to see you there. I want to see you be able to find a solid healthy relationship. Okay. No matter how good the sex is. Leave it behind. You've got to realize. 
that if the relationship, if the sex is great and the rest of the relationship's not good, jump, run, 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 run. You're in a borderline relationship. This isn't good. It's only going to get worse. And you're going to lose yourself. You know, some of the questions that I would ask you if you want to and think about this, and I talk to my clients about this all the time because this is something that's very important because, you know, you want to ask yourself a few questions. You know, what's keeping you in this relationship? What is keeping you in this relationship? Ask yourself that right now. What is keeping you in this relationship? Think about it. Ask. Be honest. What is keeping you in this relationship? Is it you just wanting to be with somebody? Is it you because you don't want to be alone? Think about it. What is it? Also, ask yourself, do you feel like you're a different person when you're around this person? Do you feel different? Do you not feel like yourself? Do you not feel like you can be yourself because yourself isn't good enough? Because that's one thing that you'll get from being around a borderline is you're not good enough. Okay? And they're not going to tell you to your face, but they're going to say it in so many words, and they're going to make you feel very insecure. And that's caused because they want to have more control over you. The more insecure you are, the more insecure you are about yourself, the more control they have over you. It's just it's self-explanatory. And have you lost yourself? You know, when I was in a borderline relationship, the one thing that the first thing that went was my sense of humor. Because I would always walk in and make jokes, and then they were funny, sweet jokes, cute. I mean, everybody else thinks they're hilarious and fun. They weren't about them, they weren't picking on anybody. It was just like a joke. And they would be like, Ashley, just shut up. My God. Can you just be quiet? Ashley, bring it down a little bit. I mean, why do you got to be like that? And it got to the point where every time I walked in the door, I just was quiet. I didn't want to say anything because I knew if I said something, it's going to start an argument. Okay? And why we stay in these relationships is beyond us because, you know, think about it. When you stay in a relationship like this, it's like being in a prison. Are you willing to take that prison sentence right now? I don't think that that's what you want. I think you're better than that. I think you should step up to the plate, and I think you have the power, and I know you have the power, to jump up and to take ownership of your life and to take a step back and to say, you know what, this isn't for me. This isn't for me. I'm not trying to save someone. I want to live my life. And this isn't for me. And so if you can sit there and understand that and you can recognize that you're dealing with a borderline and they're not willing to get treatment, it's time to exit stage right. And you're going to have to like, formulate yourself and you're going to have to get some self-worth and you're going to have to repopulate yourself because you've been beaten down to nothing. But in the process, at least you'll get better because you have a chance because you're away from it. You know, I'm going to be doing more shows on borderline because I don't think we realize the extent of it. And also, I know there's at least one out of four males are borderline, one out of three women. One out of three women are borderline. That's a lot of women. That's a lot of men. I think it might even be higher than that. So we'll be talking more about narcissism, more about borderline personality disorder and what you can do. But first off, always remember, you owe it to yourself to stay yourself. You owe it to yourself to be authentic. And you cannot be authentic if you're hiding yourself in a borderline personality disorder relationship where you can't be you because if you're you, you're gonna, they're going to start a fight. So stay tuned. we got a great show for you next. And Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. I'll be back this time in three shakes.